Good morning, Southside. Uh, my name is Daniel Sanchez. Uh, I recently graduated the uh, MTP, well, I think I'm graduating today, actually, um, the MTP program uh, here at Southside. It is an honor and a blessing uh, to stand before you this morning um, and to uh, preach God's word. Um, let's pray. The Lord God, thank you for the blessing of your word. Thank you for the blessing of your body. Thank you, Lord God, that we who were once not a people are now called your people and that you, you are our God. Father, would you, by your spirit, grant us illumination as we open up your word? Would you open up ears and hearts and minds? Would you soften hard hearts and strengthen the hearts of flesh that you have made in us, Lord God? Would you be honored this morning and give us illumination as we uh, read from your word? In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking uh, at Revelation 21, verse 3. Um, we're going to start off by reading verses 1 and 2 before it, uh, just for some context. So, Revelation uh, chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Uh, let's pray one more time. Father, we just thank you for the so many beautiful realities that your word reveals to us. God, I, I just pray that you would um, be with us as we open up your word, that you would show us Christ in greater and deeper ways, that we would, um, we would gaze at, at him and his beauty as, as he is, that he would save those who don't know you, Lord God, and strengthen those who do. That, Lord God, as we look at the beautiful truth in this passage, that, that we would find hope and assurance and comfort and peace. Lord God, that you would be with us and in everything make us more like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. My freshman year of college, uh, maybe the first week or so, uh, my roommate Royce and I decided that we were going to um, visit uh, all the campus ministries at our uh, college uh, school minds um, and then figure out which one we'd be going to uh, on a regular basis. Um, so the first uh, Wednesday of uh, the school year, uh, we went to the first ministry. Um, did not realize that most of the campus ministries uh, on their first day just kind of have a more fun hangout day. Uh, we were a little less than impressed and we, we didn't go back. Um, <laughs> Next week, we uh, went to a different campus ministry on Tuesday night. A variety of reasons, we just weren't, we didn't feel like it was, it was for us. Um, the next evening, uh, we went to the third ministry, which was uh, the Navigators. And among other things, um, they told us, in essence, we take the Bible seriously as the word of God. Um, we're going to take it seriously. We're not going to be apologetic about that, things along that line. And, and as I was looking around the room, um, I saw people who had been in the ministry kind of emphatically nodding their heads. They all agreed with it. Uh, Royce and I looked at each other, and I think we had a similar thought. We found our people. Who are your people? And what does that mean for you in your life? Well, first, let's think about this. What makes a people? What, what makes a, a people group? Well, there's a, a few things in particular here. First, um, I think a people group is a group of individuals that have something um, significant in common uh, with one another. Um, most of us, I imagine, are Americans. What do we have in common? Well, 
being born in the United States of America. Uh, we have this heritage. Um, we have this common identity, which is our our nationality. Um, we, there's other types of people groups. You have um, political groups and ideologies. Uh, libertarians, for example, are people who, uh, a people group who value a small government, uh, individual autonomy, rights, freedoms. Um, you can even get as small as, as hobbies. Um, fans of Star Wars, for example, enjoy watching and especially arguing about the Star Wars movies. Um, but alongside all of these commonalities, right, that, that's a more internal reality. Uh, people groups also tend to have a unique and a specific culture. They have a specific practice. Um, they say certain things. They refrain from cer saying certain other things. They have rituals, um, so on and so forth. I heard a survey once um, that asked various people two questions. First, are you Republican or Democrat? And second, would you prefer a dog that is independent and free-thinking or a dog that is loyal and obedient? You may not be surprised. The Democrats preferred the dog that was independent and free-thinking. The Republicans preferred the dog that was the loyal, obedient family dog. Um, I saw another survey recently that said Republicans are apparently more likely to shop at King Supers and Democrats at Safeway. Um, <laughs> What I'm trying to say here is just even in, the, in bigger things, but even in smaller things, um, people groups have, they, they live out their lives in, in certain ways, um, certain practices. As, as Americans, we, we tip our servers, right? Or at least we should be tipping our servers. Other places in the world, other people groups, they either don't do this in general, or if you were to try doing this, they would find offense at it. And so I think what we see, a people group is something that is both internal and external. Um, we all belong to various people groups, whether we uh, want to or not, whether we think we do uh, or not. If you don't think you belong to a people group, you belong to a particular type of people group called a nonconformist, um, still a people group. Um, but this morning, I want to ask the question, and what I want to think about is this. Who are your people and what does that mean for you? We see that addressed here in our passage this morning, Revelation 21, 3. At the end of all things, in the new heavens, the new earth, it is written that we will be God's people and he will be our God. Now, of course, if Revelation 21.3 was the only passage in the Bible where this was recorded, where this idea took place, I think it would be quite beautiful. I think um, we could draw a great many applications for it. But as it stands, this particular passage, this occurrence of this idea of God being our God and we being his people, Revelation 23 is not the passage that introduces it, but more so the passage that seems to conclude it. This idea, this passage comes after the entire Bible uses and develops this idea. This promise of God saying, I will be your God and you will be my people is intricately woven throughout redemptive history from the garden to the new heavens and the new earth. And it paints a beautiful picture that should fill us with the greatest of hope and joy. And so I want us to understand just how important, just how wonderful this statement is. And so this morning, what we're going to be doing is looking, um, tracing this thread throughout the Bible, um, seeing what this means for us, um, what this promise of I will be your God and you will be my people means. Um, and so we will be jumping around a little bit this morning. And so I just want to give you three simple um, points. First, the promise of I will be your God and you will be my people anticipated Christ in the Old Testament. It was fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament. And finally, it is the hope and assurance of the church in the present day until Christ returns. As with many things, um, this theme of I will be your God and you will be my people, it finds its roots in creation and in the fall of man. Um, and so we're going to start by looking there. 
Now, I imagine most of us know the story of creation and the fall. If you've ever tried reading through the Bible cover to cover, I assume you've read through the first three, three chapters. Um, so we're not gonna go over every aspect uh, of the creation story, but let's remember as we go into this, God made everything, the universe, everything in it, and he said that it was good. But when God made mankind, humanity, man and woman, he did not just say that it was good, he said that mankind was very good. Not only this, but the Bible says that we as humanity were made in God's image. The animals were not, the trees were not, the earth, the creation, the stars, anything else. We were made in God's image. And so there's a few things that we can take from this and from the rest of the creation narrative. God made us to be in right relationship with him. There's a number of implications we could draw from us being made in the image of God, but one of those is that God is the only thing that can satisfy us that we were made to be in right relationship with God, that we were made to glorify him and to enjoy him. It says in, in the creation narrative, God would walk in the garden with us. We were made to be in relationship with God. And not only this, but God placed humanity in the garden of Eden, which was rich with fruit of every kind, of, of water to drink and blessing, peace, prosperity, and best of all, relationship with God, which was symbolized by the tree of life. I think one might even say that in creation, God had effectively said to Adam and Eve, I am your God and you are my people. As we know, however, this unfortunately, tragically does not last. Satan, the serpent, tempts Adam and Eve to sin. God had told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and Satan comes to them and says, you should, you should do this. And they do. Adam and Eve, humanity, effectively, traded right relationship with God for a piece of fruit. And in sinning against God, the creation and our very natures as humans were corrupted. The relationship with God that we were supposed to have and enjoy was severed. There was death, and as a result, there would also be eternal wrath for our sins. Adam and Eve now were exiled from the garden, away from the tree of life, away from the presence of God. The blessings of the garden were taken away, and instead they received curse. And in sending them out, in casting them out, it was as if God said to them, no longer am I your God, and no longer are you my people. This is the fall. This is paradise lost, and the curse of the fall has been on all humanity since then. But there was hope. It was not as though God just cast them out and that was it. No, when God cursed Satan, he gave what is called the Proto-Euangelion, the first gospel. He promised that an offspring would come from Adam and Eve who would destroy the works of Satan, who would restore what was lost in the fall and I dare say make it better than before. And so we see that even though there was a separation between God and man, God intended to fix what was broken. As we read through the next few chapters of Genesis, what we see is this play out. The first generation after Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, one brother kills the other. Humanity commits atrocities, horrifying evil, yet God shows his love in greater and deeper ways. One of the most significant examples of this is in the life of a man named Abraham. Once again, unfortunately, I'd love to talk about Abraham all day, but we don't have time to go over everything. Abraham was called by God away from his family, from his people, from his homeland, 
And God promised him that he would receive a land of his own. Nations and kings would descend from him and among many other things, children as numerous as the stars. Abraham was promised many, many, many blessings by God, yet one of these towers above the rest. Look with me at Genesis 17, 7. God says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. To Abraham, God gives this promise of I will be your God and you will be my people. Say what you will about the Abrahamic covenant. When I look at this, I am convinced that this is the single most important and significant promise that God made to Abraham. Abraham did not receive all of the land. He did not see all of his children or all of the nations that would come from him. These are real promises with real meanings. But Abraham did not receive all of these things in his lifetime. But he did receive God. He did have right relationship with God. The chasm, the severed relationship between God and man in Abraham, it was healed. God said to Abraham, I will be your God. Let's draw out a few implications of this as we continue to look at this theme here. First, uh, implication of this, I believe, This shows a beginning, or at least a promise, of the reversal of the curse, a reversal of the fall of man. You see, humanity had been exiled. As we said, humanity effectively, God had said, or to humanity, God effectively had said, I am not your God and you are not my people. And yet now to Abraham, he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. Note something here as well. This is not Abraham saying this to God, but God saying this to Abraham. God is the one who chose Abraham. God is the one who is choosing his people. God is the one who is saying, there is this eternal chasm between me and you, but I am going to take you and bring you to my side and I will be your God and you will be my people. I think, though, this raises a question. You see, this this promise, this is an intimate relationship. This is a repairing of the relationship. This is a bringing humanity near. How is this going to happen? Right? We have sin, and that sin leads to separation from God. The sin of humanity caused this separation, and it continues to bring separation between us and God. And so how can right relationship be restored. This is where, uh, as I mentioned, our first point, the promise of I will be your God and you will be my people anticipates the Messiah in the Old Testament. We cannot simply be in right relationship with God without being cleansed of our sinful nature and forgiven our sins. And so if God is the one to make us his own people, I believe that this promise must involve him accomplishing that. God is the one who will provide the means of restoring the relationship that has been broken. And I think we see this in the promise. Note here that Abraham says, Um, that the promise is not just to Abraham, but to Abraham's offspring after him. There is a sense in which this is plural. What we will focus on this morning, however, is the singular sense of this word, offspring. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 3 says just this, that this promise is not necessarily referring to the plural, but to the singular, that person being Christ, the Messiah who is promised to Adam and Eve to save them. What this ultimately means, I think, is that in in this promise of I will be your God and you will be my people, God is promising a Messiah who will accomplish just that. 
And one final implication from this, I believe this promise of I will be your God and you will be my people, it promises a resurrection from the dead and a life after death. We may not see this specifically in Genesis 17, but we see this throughout the rest of the Bible. After the life of Abraham, God says, he identifies himself as the God of Abraham. I am the God of Abraham, not, not, I was the God of Abraham. What does that mean? Abraham is alive. There is a resurrection. There is hope. The curse brought death, and yet somehow there is life. How? That gets revealed over time, and we'll look at that. But we see it is intrinsically tied to the promise of the Messiah. And we see these two things function now in parallel, this promise of I will be your God and you will be my people and the promise now of the Messiah. When we look at the Mosaic covenant, for example, this is a covenant of types and shadows which point to and anticipate Christ. The sacrificial system, the priesthood, all of these things, they point to and anticipate Christ. And what do we see throughout Exodus uh, to Deuteronomy? I will be your God and you will be my people. We see this Exodus 6, 7 and Deuteronomy 7, 6. We see this in the Mosaic covenant, the promise of the Messiah and the promise of I will be your God and you will be my people. Next, we see this in the Davidic covenant. This is the covenant that anticipates Christ as king. God promises to David, the man after his own heart, that there will be a descendant who comes after him, who rules over his people forever. And we may not directly see this covenant formula, this promise of I will be your God and you will be my people, but what we do see in this is how will God relate to his people. God himself will rule over them as king. And so what we see now is the promise of the Messiah was made to humanity. It was continued through Abraham. It is now continued through the line of David. This Messiah will not only save us, this Messiah will rule over us. And the final and perhaps most significant place of anticipation is in the promise of the new covenant. You see, Israel was not at a good place when the new covenant was made. They and their rampant idolatry had led to punishment from God. They were going to be taken captive um, by a foreign nation, ruled over them. There was darkness. It, It was not a good place to be in, yet God promises them hope. If you'll look with me at Jeremiah chapter 31, this is the promise of the new covenant. God says, uh, beginning in verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, Uh, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. God promises to his people a covenant that is better than the Mosaic covenant. He will write his law on their hearts. We see elsewhere that he will, just, he will give them new hearts. They shall know God. They shall have their sins forgiven. What else God says? I will be their God and they shall be my people When God says this, when God promises this, he is promising salvation and a right and restored relationship with his people and blessing as well. And so we see this promise of I will be your God and you will be my people anticipates the Messiah 
in the Old Testament. With this in mind now, we look at the New Testament and how Christ fulfills this promise. Obviously, we cannot look at the entire life of Jesus, just as with the fall, just as with the garden, just as with Abraham, but I want us to look at two particular events. First, I want to look at the promise of the Messiah that was made to the Virgin Mary. To Mary, an angel from the Lord comes and says that she will give birth to the Messiah. Hope is here. All of these promises, all of these things that we've looked at, salvation, right relationship, restoration, reversal of the curse, this angel is saying to Mary, the one who will bring this, you will give birth to. And in response to this wonderful news, she sings a song of praise um, in Luke 1, uh, or Luke chapter 1. Uh, we'll, let's look real quick at uh, Luke 1, uh, verses 54 through 55. Mary's song of praise, is, it's so beautiful. And she concludes it by saying, verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And so I think what Mary recognizes now, everything we looked at, everything that's being anticipated, everything that was promised is here and this child that she will give birth to is the one who will fulfill and the one who will bring this reality. Jesus is born now, and he lives a perfect life. Adam and Eve succumbed to temptation and fell into sin in the garden. Christ, however, was tempted in every way, yet never once sinned. Jesus lived the perfect life that we could never live, yet he died in our place, taking upon himself the punishment for our sins. He died in our place. But he also rose from the dead, triumphing over sin and death. And so I think what we see ultimately in the death and resurrection of Christ, the fall is reversed. What is lost is now restored. The fall brought sin and death. Jesus died for our sins, and he triumphs over death. Not only that, but he offers life to those who would trust in him. The fall may have severed the relationship between God and man. Remember, no longer my, your God, no longer my people. Yet, in the person of Jesus, we not only have a restored relationship with God, but we are called his own children. The fall corrupted our nature and our desires, yet those who are in Christ are given a new heart, and it is written that the old sinful self is dead. Christ fulfills this promise. This now is where I want to revisit the idea of what a people is. We, we talked about this earlier. What makes a people? And now what does that mean for us? First, remember what makes a people? A people is a group of individuals who have something significant in common. And so if we are called God's people, or better yet, let's focus on this first. How do you become God's people? Right? We looked at all these things. Jesus triumphs over sin. Jesus um, triumphs over death. He's resurrected and he's offering these things to us. How, how do we receive this? How might we become God's people? The Bible makes clear it is through faith in Jesus. It is through belief in Christ, belief in the living God, believing in his death and resurrection, in him being our Lord. And so that is how we become God's people. Next, what does it mean for us who have been saved to be called God's people, right? A people group has something significant in common. There's something that unites a people group. What is it that unites us? Well, the phrase God's people should give a hint. Quite simply, what unites us as God's people is belief in the triune God and in the death and resurrection of Jesus 
Christ, if you have faith, if you believe in Jesus and trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins, you are called God's people. What unites us is the salvation that God has provided for us. This isn't something we should just be thinking about once a week. This isn't something that that should just be a casual thing. Don't file this. Don't make this category of personhood something akin to another type of, of personhood. We're talking here about the God of the universe, about eternity, about relationship, about union with the living God. And if you are known, if you are called a child of the God of the universe, there is no greater thing. Therefore, what I want to put forth is that our identity as God's people is the most significant thing about us. There is no greater thing than that we are God's people. There is no greater thing to be than saved. There is no greater thing to be than to be known by the God of the universe. We are God's people. There is no greater thing. This unites us like nothing else should. If you have faith, you have more in common with a Russian, with an Iranian, with a Palestinian, with anybody else on the earth who has faith than you do someone exactly like you, but who does not have Christ. This unites us more than anything else. I remember my, my high school had a quote on the wall. Um, I saw it most days when I walked to class. It said, religion is like a pair of shoes. Find one that fits you, just don't make me wear your pair. Basically, what this was telling us every day in school your faith is a private matter, good for you, keep it to yourself. Don't talk about it. And I'm saying here, nothing could be further from the truth. This is the most significant thing in our life, whether we treat it that way or not. And so as we are thinking about this, being God's people and what this means for us, what I want to ask is, does our life look like this is the most significant thing to us? Do we talk about God in our casual conversations with other people? Are we more likely to pick up our TV remote and turn on the news or open up our Bible and read God's word? Is church on Sunday a burden or a necessity to us? Is prayer something we have to do or something we get to do? Do we spend time with God, not just to see things changed in our life, but because we simply love the God who has saved us and desire to be with him? We are called God's people, and this is the most significant aspect of our lives. Does our lives reflect that? So that's the internal. What about the external? Remember, we also said people groups have a culture. We have practice. There's things that we do that flow out of what we are. What is the culture of God's people? What's well, actually very similar to what makes us God's people. It is Christ at the center of our lives. We are united in Christ and the culture of God's people is being like Christ. It is love, it is righteousness, it is a desire to keep the commandments of God, not to be saved, but because we have been saved. It is a desire to be like and to look like Christ. And so the culture of God's people is love and Christ-likeness. And so what does that look like? I think two passages in particular, Romans 12 um, and 1 Corinthians 13, we show love, we show hospitality, we worship God, we rejoice with those who rejoice, we weep with those who weep. This church, I just gotta say, we do, a, you all have just done a phenomenal job at that. We've just felt such, my wife and I, such great love and kindness and hospitality here. Thank you, keep doing that. We honor God because we have been saved. This is the culture of God's people. 
And we do so in such a way that it is strange and yet attractive to the rest of the world. While I was thinking about this this week, I heard a story um, about how the church in India uh, has grown. Um, among many other things, um, something that was attractive to many of the Indian Christians uh, was that the Protestant missionaries would come to India and instead of treating the lower castes as untouchables, not associating with them, not talking with them, despising them, no, the Christians would love the lower castes. They, they wouldn't give them any extra hurdles to status or love or any of these things. They showed love, they showed Christ-likeness to the untouchables and the despised. And many have come to faith as a result in that. Why? Because God's people demonstrated a culture of love. And so, summarizing this point, our identity as God's people is the most significant thing about us. There is no greater thing than to be known by God. God's people, for God's people, sorry, our culture is one of holiness, of Christ-likeness, and love. So we've talked about what this means internally and externally, but there's one more thing that I'd like to focus on, and that is the third point that I had mentioned earlier. This promise of I will be your God and you will be my people is our hope and assurance now until Christ returns. Specifically, what I want to look at here with respect to this point is the Last Supper and Jesus' inauguration of the new covenant. Remember this new covenant reality. Reversal of the curse, blessing, salvation, new hearts, hearts that love to follow God and honor him. Jesus breaks bread, he gives thanks, and he distributes it to his disciples and says, take, eat, this is my body. After this, he takes a cup and he says, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Salvation, adoption, restoration, blessing in Christ, all of these things are here. We took communion last week. Remember next time you take it, this is a sign of, of God saying to us, really, I am your God and you are my people. This is the blessing of the new covenant. Not just this, but Jesus before he ascended into heaven, he said in the Great Commission that all authority on heaven and earth had been given to him. When we read through the Gospels, what we see, the kingdom is a present reality. Jesus is ruling and reigning now. All of these promises that we've looked at are here and fulfilled in Christ. And yet, I imagine that most people in here can think of things that don't line up with this reality perfectly. Maybe you know someone close to you who died. Unexpectedly, expectedly, it still hurts. Maybe you know someone, maybe you yourself are struggling through illness, cancer, sickness, chronic diseases. I, I know the young marrieds group who my, my wife and I love dearly has gone through so much of this recently. Maybe you have a loved one who's walked away from the faith. Maybe you have a loved one who's never been interested in the faith. Maybe you've been praying time and time again, begging that God would answer your prayers, that he would hear, hear your prayers and answer them, and so far it seems like nothing's happened. Maybe you turn on the news and see atrocities committed by other countries and then see that we have plenty of sin here at home too. And you don't necessarily hear this on the news all the time, but maybe you also hear about God's own people being persecuted, despised, put to death, thrown in jail throughout the world. And so how do we reconcile these realities, right? I think it is clear in the New Testament, these wonderful, beautiful realities, these blessings are here, and yet we also see at this present time there is hardship and there is suffering. 
And so what do we do with these? Because I think if we truly understand this first reality, that God is our God and we are his people, it will help us through this hardship of this present life. What do we do with these things? How do we reconcile these two realities? Well, first, first, I think we remember the promises that God has made for his people in our present age. God really throughout all of the Bible, especially in the New Testament, we just see so many promises that God has made for his people. God has said that he loves you. Let's just start there. God has said that he loves you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? The God of the universe said that he loves you. We ought to believe that. Hold tightly to that. Hold fast to that. Remember that. That is the promise that God has made for us, that he loves us. Second, God has told us that he hears and he answers our prayers. Through Christ, we can approach the throne with confidence. God hears our prayers. God answers our prayers. Next, and this maybe gives some context for when it seems like our prayers aren't being answered. God has promised in Romans 8, 28, he works all things together for the good of those who love him. When God doesn't answer our prayers, it's not because he doesn't love us. It's not because, it's not because he doesn't love us. It's not because he doesn't hear us. He actually answers them in the way he does because he loves us and because he hears us. And the way that God answers our prayers, make no mistake, if you are saved and you pray to God, he answers, he hears your prayers. And the way that he does it is the best thing for us, whether we realize it or not. This is a promise that God has made to us. Psalm 46, God calls himself our fortress. We can rest in God, we can trust in God, we can hide in God, so we do not need to be afraid when things happen in this world that are terrifying. God has promised finally, and I think most significantly, that his people are eternally secured in him. Something else about this statement, I will be your God and you will be my people. This is an unconditional statement. God simply says, I will be your God and you will be my people. No conditions, he just says, I will be your God and you will be my people. There are no conditions to entry. I also don't see any conditions for exiting. Those who God has saved, he will keep and hold until the end. God, to those whom God has given salvation, he will not let anyone take it away. We, if we have true faith in the Lord God, are eternally secured in him. And so we can rest in these things in the present. One more thing. In this, we look ahead to the future that God has for his people. So he's made uh, promises to us now. There's promises and hope for the future as well. The apostle Paul was persecuted, shipwrecked, stoned, close to death, thrown in prison, betrayed, hated, despised, all of these things, I could go on. He suffered so very much, and yet he says that these were all light and momentary afflictions. How does he say that? I think it's because his eyes were not focused on the pain of the present, but on the future that God has for his people. This morning, we began by reading Revelation 21, 1 through 3. Let's now read this again. Assuming, of course, I can turn there. Um, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, Coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. We stopped reading there. 
Let's go on. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Things will be hard. Things will be difficult. There will be pain now. But Jesus told his people that. But we don't focus on those things. We put our eyes on what lies ahead. God has promised no more pain, no more crying, no more mourning, no more death, no hardships, just joy and peace. We will live in perfect relationship with God as we were meant to do, experiencing his perfect love, his perfect blessing for all of eternity. This is our heritage as God's people. We look ahead to that and we don't set our focus on the hardships of the presence. And the present. This reminds me in Psalm 85, the psalmist asks God to revive his people. He remembers God's faithfulness in the past. He's asking God to work once more. But what does he do? He sets his eyes on the future. He says, let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. I, I just feel sometimes that we too easily fall into despair. We, we turn on the news and we just get horrified about what's happening. We get horrified about what's going on in the church. Terrified, terrified, terrified. We fall into fear. We lose sight of these promises. I just want us to, to look and remember what God has promised us. Yes, things are hard now, but it's not always going to be this way. God is making things better for his people now, and he will give us rich blessing in the future. We set our eyes not on the things of the present, but on the future. We hope for the future. So now I want to just say, if you do not know Christ, if you do not have faith in him, I just encourage you to think about what could be. Don't fool yourself into thinking that the things of this world will satisfy you. No, God has made you to be in relationship with him and so nothing less than that will satisfy you. All of these things that we talked about, life, joy, blessing, peace, no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow, none of it, this could all be yours if you believe in Christ. Your sins could be taken away from you. You could be made right with God and be restored to perfect relationship with him. Why wouldn't you want that? Why, why wouldn't you want that? Think about what could be. And to the believers, I just want to say this. I need to say this to myself too. Remember who you are. You are God's people. He has called you his own. He has loved you, saved you. Right now he is sanctifying you. He holds you in his hands. He will make you whole. He will wipe away every tear and you will dwell in his love for eternity. He will be our God and we will be his people. Let's rest in that. Let's hope in that he is our God and we are his people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the blessing that we can call you our God and that we can be reckoned your people. Lord God, this is not something that we deserved, but it is something that you have given. Father, would we rest in this? Would we trust in you in this? Would, 
you bless us in this. Lord, please strengthen those of us um, who fall into fear and despair, those of us who have hardships and difficulties. Lord God, let us be comforted by the reality that you are our God and we are your people. Father, would you be with us? Would this reality always be in our mind and never go away? Father, we love you and we thank you that you have loved us so deeply. Lord God, please help us and keep us and make us more like Christ in everything. In Jesus' name. Amen.